Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Siti Nur Aisha binti Sheikh Huzair with matrix number 2118598. The topic for today's presentation is regarding alcohol abuse among teenagers in Indonesia. First question to be answered is the number are concerning and alarming. According to the statistic from National Drug Survey of Indonesian Students 2016, from almost 35,000 students, 30.7% from them are consuming alcohol and also 2.1% are taking drugs. Total of 6,000 students, it may be a small number compared to the total 35,000 students, but aren't the number are going to climb up year by year. According to Health Survey, that male teenagers are more anticipated with alcohol than the female teenagers, up for almost 40%. It not just emerge as a public health issue, but it shows how the future of the young nation of Indonesia will be. I will divide the representation into three parts. The factor, the statistic, and also the suggestion. From my point of view, the factors can happen due to external and internal factors. Firstly, the internal factor. It may be influenced by their feelings, by their thoughts. The feelings of failure and loss in the middle of teenage life may lead to it. By consuming alcohol, the teenager thinks that they can escape from all those breakdowns. It creates the escapism from them. And the second factor, which is the external factor, may be influenced by their surrounding. In one of the study of Indonesia National Narcotic, that most external concrete factors are the family environment and also the family characteristic. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Ahmad Faiz Lokman bin Abdul Hamid with method number 2015205. So the topic from the presentation today is the uh, sectorism uh, of Iraq. So uh, sectarian violence, uh, violence in Iraq refer to the violence, uh, violence that uh, develop as a result of rising, uh, of rising sectarian tensions between the different religions and ethnic group of Iraq. Uh, mostly, uh, we can say that. And the conflict between the Shia Muslim as the majority and the Sunni Muslim uh, as the minority within the country. With the uh, creation of the modern uh, nation, uh, uh, nation state, uh, sectarian tensions uh, arose slowly and uh, eventually development uh, into uh, recent violent, violent uh, conflicts such as the war in Iraq uh, and the Iraqi uh, civil war. So, uh, the data say the majority of Iraq are Shia Arab Muslims, amounting to around uh, 64 to 69 of the population. The Sunni uh, are split ethnically among Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmen. So, after the after the first world war, the population of Iraq was uh, unified uh, into one nation uh, state under the British mandate. This, uh, the, this uh, decisions to implement Sunni uh, leadership, uh, this bit a Sunni uh, minority in Iraq, create an uh, ex exclusion uh, exclusion of other religion. Other others uh, religions and ethnic group uh, such as uh, Shia, Kurds, and other religions uh, minorities. So after uh, 1992, the Iraqi government keep expanding uh, its uh, bureaucracy, increasing Sunni control over state uh, machinery. Although greater uh, control of the government uh, means uh, fewer uprising and uh, reuttering, uh, sectarian tensions among the Iraqi population keep growing. So uh, these different tensions uh, eventually result in the 40 Juli uh, revolution 
of uh, one nine. Uh... Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Azra Ali binti Abdullah. Matric number two zero one eight zero six two. So today, uh, one of the social ills in the Muslim world that I want to talk about today is a uh, rape. So actually, rape is a form of sexual assault that occurs when someone is forced into sexual activity without their consent. So uh, this can include um, water touching like fondling or other sexual acts, you know, and rape also can be perpetrated or committed by acquaintance, friends, or even family members. So uh, rape also can cause physical and psychological injuries, you know, like uh, physical like bruises, cuts, and broken bones, and uh, for f- psychological, you know, uh, such as fear, anxiety, depression, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So actually, uh, rape victims often struggle with feelings of shame, guilt, and worthlessness, and may have difficulty trusting others or forming healthy relationships. In, in, in Islam, we call this as Fozina, and uh, and we can divide it into three categories, which are adult rape, mahram rape, and child rape. And, and actually, there are a lot of causes why rape has happened in the Muslim world. And it is important to recognize that rape is not about sexual desire or attraction, but about power uh, but about power and control. Because rapid use sexual violence to assert power and dominance over their victims. You know, other reasons why a person rape can uh, cause they are influenced by social media and end up stuck with pornography and to the extent it leads to rape crime and it may also happen when a person could not lower their gift and uh, um my, my yeah and actually to my surprise that the crime that rape crime does not only happen you know uh, from unknown rapists, you know, anonymously, because according to statistics from National Sexual Assault, uh, the highest percentage of uh, rapes are committed is actually by the acquaintance, you know, and then followed by illegal partners, you know, like boyfriends, girlfriends, and the third one is by family members, and lastly, by the strangers. So, uh, the solution that we can propose here is that uh, mother. A mother, a mother can play important part in this one because al um, al um madrasa ula, right? Uh, she's a madrasa for children. So parents can teach about to their children about you know sex education, such as you know safe safe touch and unsafe touch means means like uh what body parts that uh, people can touch and what body parts of us that people can touch. And the second one is uh. Parents also should educate children, you know, from early age, you know, to separate rooms between male and female siblings. And and not only that, they also need to teach them, you know, how to wear appropriate clothes even even they are just sitting at home. Because, you know, uh, even we are just with family members, uh, we also have our limit lah, limit uh, in terms of aura. And also, as a wife also, choosing a husband who understands religions and being responsible is very important. Because, you know, uh, we want to find someone that that can protect us, that can protect us instead of traumatize uh, our children, right? And then, I think, uh, secondly, and you also can play a, a role, you know, by spreading awareness to the community about the crime of rape, you know, maybe like by creating a program and then, uh, especially in secondary schools, to prevent it by opening uh, the eyes of teenagers to what the causes of rape, uh, uh, sorry, causes the crime of rape, you know, maybe such as, you know, teach them the boundaries between men and women because when people do not care about the equity like be- between men and women, it can lead to the rape crime. And maybe also we can talk about the disadvantages of having boyfriend and birth- uh, boyfriends and girlfriends that also can lead to the rape crimes, you know. And thirdly, uh, the authorities must also must close the premises that have possibilities uh, having unhealthy activities such as nightclubs and karaoke. And this place, you know, is a target place for people to find the victims to put something in their drinks. And then um, the rape crime happen, right? So, okay, yeah. I think that's uh, only, that's the, I think that's all from me. Thank you.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Afifah Hayati binti Abdullah and my metric number is 2023012. And my topic is ABC parents in Para. During our last online class, we have learned about types of parenting style and all of the student in the class has spoken about that. And I think no one in the class have any problem with their parents, right? So we have to be grateful for that because there are people out there is struggling and still suffering with their abusive parents. We all know abuse is a criminal act where it will give serious harm not only towards our physical body but as well as emotional harm. Some might have led to the result of death if we didn't prevent it from happening. Of course, there are various types of child abuse including physical abuse, neglecting, sexual harming, emotional abuse, exploitation and so on. You can name it yourself. Yes, that's true that Islam taught us to honor and respect our parents regardless of their behavior. Allah even state in Al-Quran that we have to be al walidain which means that we have to be kind and respect our uh, parents. Uh, parents also should be the one who protect and treat their children in the best possible way. But when it comes to ABC parents, can we still put our respect towards them? Yes, uh, maybe. But it's not something that we could tolerate and we have to do something about that. How can the one who should protect the children is the one who leave physical scars and want to their children? And why this social is happen? What is the reason behind that? Usually, if the parents have no problem and love their children, they will not do anything stupid towards the kids. But abuse can happen when the parents themselves have another problem to cope with. For example, they might have lost their job, do drugs, have disorder, lack of parenting skills, have a family stress, divorce and separation, mental health issue, or most importantly, financial issue. And this problem might cause them to release their anger and hatred to their children. Because there's an issue in Pera where 8 years old boy passed away in the Sungai Siput Hospital and police found several injury marks on his body and it was confirmed that his mother is the one who abused him. And the only reason for her to abuse his own child was because uh, she just had divorced with her husband 6 months prior to the incident. Para also records 60% increase of child abuse cases between 2015 until 2018 which means the children in Para have been suffering from their abusive parents many times ago and it keep on increasing every year. But this problem actually didn't only happen in Para, it happened everywhere in Malaysia, in outside Malaysia, other countries as well. But of course, every problem comes with its own solutions and remedies. The first thing we could do is to report this problem to the authorities if we happen to see this around us like our neighborhood or our it happened among our family members or among our close friends. It's true that we should not interrupt others' problem but if the problem is getting serious, the least thing we could do uh, is to help them to report. The second one is to uh, is the solutions for the parents themselves. If they love their children and still have say, some sake of humility inside them but they just could not control their anger, they have to meet doctor or therapist immediately for the sake of their mental health. But if the parents have no humility at all and they don't love their children, um, then the children themselves have to take the action or if they're afraid, they might ask people around them uh, or people around them should aware about it. I think that's all for me. I would like to end my presentation here and I hope my sharing will be beneficial for all of us. And thank you so much for listening. Hi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings to Dr. Abdul Hamid, Muhammad Ali Zoram, and my fellow friends. I am Farzana Bandazikipi, metric number 210498. In this video, I will present to you my topic about poverty in South Africa. Alright, poverty can be defined as the condition in which the individual of family specific needs such as food, clothing, shelter and education are not fulfilled. Poverty has become a major global issue and various efforts are being made to eradicate poverty. But the problem is uh, the problem is that it will not go away immediately. This issue has an impact on people's daily life such as poor health, malnutrition, unemployment, and lack of education. In Sarawak, Dato Sri Wong Sumko says, about 67,000 Sarawakian households live below the poverty line income level, based on the household income and basic immunity survey report 
by State and Administrative District Sarawak 2019. According to the latest data published by the Department of Statistics Malaysia in 2020, Sarawak is the third poorest state in Malaysia with a poverty rate of 12.9%, and Pusa, Tebedu, and Matu are the three districts with highest poverty um, in 2019 in the rural areas. There are various causes of poverty in Sarawak, but the most crucial is uh, low income. For example, we can look from uh, Pusat, Tebedu and Matu. The median income is around 2,400 ringgit to 2,700 ringgit. As compared to Bintulu, which is the median income is around 7,400 ringgit. And we can say that we can look, uh, we can look that uh, Pusat, Tebedu and Matu has the lowest incidence of poverty in the state, as mentioned by Professor Dr. Dr. Medin Burma. Islam does not view poverty as a virtue but accept it as a serious social problem that has negative effects that must be elevated and bring some suggestions concerning its solution. Islam also has provided some guidelines to eliminate its negative effects. In addition, the other world religion also try to solve this serious social problem by establishing some regulations and uh, giving advice to their followers, such as protecting the oppressed people from oppressive cruelty, helping needy persons, and maintaining the lives of the aged, orphans, and the handicapped persons in the society. Eradicating poverty and sorrow takes time and requires a focus on what government should do and what individual needs to do what government needs to do and what uh, individual needs to do there are several solutions to eradicate the poverty such as the Cluardo malaysia hardcore poverty eradication program which targeted six of the 10 localities in sarawak so the welfare assistance will be implemented through activities and initiatives uh, to generate and boost their sources of income. Furthermore, the government should build and upgrade road connectivity networks, especially roads linking the interior areas of Sarawak. Hence, this initiative can ease the burden of the affected people. Uh, it will also provide an opportunity for them to find jobs because road networks connect places that may provide job opportunities so they can earn a living, increase their income, and unemployment rate will be decreased. Besides, uh, the right networks may provide an opportunity for children to pursue education. Education is, ne is needed for them to upgrade their lives in the future. In a nutshell, poverty is not an easy issue to be solved immediately. But slowly, we do efforts to eradicate it because everyone has the right to live with educated basic needs. Therefore, we as human beings should help each other when they are needed in terms of welfare and financial aspects. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall give infinite rewards for those who give to help uh, for others with the sake of Him. So that's all from me. Thanks for watching. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Farah Nabiha Minti Muhammad Rafi. My magic number is 2017622. I would like to explain on my topic, poverty in Bangladesh. Poverty is a global issue that happen usually on low income and developing country, for example, Bangladesh. The poverty has been viewed as a negative nature and could lead to many various problems to the individual society and countries. From the Department of Economy and Social Affairs to the United Nations, the statistic of poverty in Bangladesh shown a decline number in the proportion of population living below the extreme poverty line from 35% in 2000, 26% in 2005, 20% in 2010, and the latest is about 15% in 2016. Among the reasons of the decline number in the statistic are including they were given social assistance cash benefit, 
Mothers and newborns may directly cash benefit and covered with social protection benefit. It can be understood that if they are given financial assistance, the number of poverty cases can be reduced. Among the factors of poverty in Bangladesh is because of the lack of job opportunities. As mentioned in an article titled Root Causes and Consequences of Extreme Poverty in Northern Bangladesh, not only they have cheap labor, but they are also unable to establish new industry due to capital constraint and shortage of entrepreneurs. Other than that, the factors of poverty in Bangladesh is due to natural disasters and climate changes. A few people in Bangladesh depend on the agriculture for their main job and source of income. The natural disasters like drought and cyclone that happen in the country might affect the agriculture industry and give pressure to them. Next, the other factors of the poverty in Bangladesh are the negative mindset towards the goal of life. As Bangladesh known as a poor country, some of the people have no desire to change their life and have the mindset like, we are poor and we can do anything. They have less passion in living their life. Hence, among the impact of poverty are, it can affect the development planning of the countries, become the threat to human values and thinking, as well as could affect the overall security and stability of society. It also resulted in the occurrence of crimes and hatred between rich and poor in Bangladesh. Among the solutions to encounter this problem is by eliminating oppression and exploitation of power in the society. Ensure fair rights of the individuals according to Islam can eliminate oppression and exploitation. As mentioned by al Mawardi in his writing, to uphold justice and avoid all exploitation in accordance with the Sharia, he should restrain the strong from exploiting the weak and help the weak in getting due from the strong. It means that the people who have the power in his hand like the ruler, the government, have to help the weaker people because he has the capability to make changes and help the weaker to be better. Therefore, by having the rights for all individuals in the society, it can ensure socio-economic uh, stability and establish a welfare society where it can, means the poverty can be reduced. Second, poverty can be encountered by abolish mismanagement and corruption of public funds. The resources which are given by Allah must be utilized efficiently, equitably, and transparently. Islam demands that all the resources at the disposal of human beings must be utilized efficiently and equitably to fulfill the needs of all and to bring about an equitable distribution of income and wealth. It can help the people to access justice and secure the people's faith. Last but not least, by encouraging brotherhood, which is equal and cooperation, can help to reduce poverty in society. Said by Imam Al Ghazali, the completed friendship is when two people similar, share similar enjoyment based on the right to wealth and properties. By encouraging equal and cooperation, it led to the people to practice the value of helping each other, thus, there will be no poverty in the society. Also reported by Numan bin Bashir, the messenger of Allah said, the believers in their mutual kindness, compassion, and sympathy are just like one body. When one of the limbs suffers, the whole body responds to it with fullness and fever. Hadith narrated by Al-Buhari and Muslim. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Farham bin Muhammad Hussein. My metric number is 2119477. And for my assignment, I've done suicide in Kazakhstan and in, in Iran. Uh, suicide in Kazakhstan and Iran. So high percentage of suicide occur at certain group and many factors behind the occurrence. So in Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan they call it a high percentage of suicide among children by the age of 15 to 19. So basically, uh, it covers children and teenagers. Uh, meanwhile, in Iran, Iran demonstrates a higher percentage of suicide among women compared to men. But in terms of age group, uh, it is claimed that a high percentage that uh, of age group uh, occur from 15 years old to 35 years old. Uh, so for this part, I will explain about statistic of suicide uh, that is happening in Kazakhstan and Iran. So uh, in Kazakhstan, male recorded higher percentage of suicide compared to female, more likely to suicide compared to girl, female teenager more likely to commit suicide, and 12.2 percentage of all deaths covered by suicide in Kazakhstan. So in Iran, 
mostly occur among the age of 15 to 35, uh, meaning that it has wider age group. Uh, suicide rate is 5.3, meaning that uh, 5 people more likely to commit suicide uh, in 100,000 population. Uh, suicide mostly occur during summer. Mostly those who commit are married. Suicide among women is higher than men. And lastly, boy recorded higher number of suicide compared to girl. So meaning that in Iran, uh, child suicide also occur, such as Kazakhstan. But Kazakhstan recorded higher number of child suicide compared to Iran. So, so in this part, I will talk about factors. So I will only point out the factors that related with family management. So first one, family issue. So in Kazakhstan, fighting between children and parents are very common, uh, and then parents lack of attention. So and it, it is claimed that the parents only spend 20 minutes of the daily time with their children, meaning that the children will not receive sufficient love and eventually uh, it will lead to depression. Uh, and then in Iran, conflict between couple and their parents uh, and improper relationship between parents and their children. Same as Kazakhstan, uh, parents, in, uh, parents in Iran also fight with their children. Uh, in addition, uh, the married couple itself will have con some may have conflict with their uh, family in law and it uh, leads to suicidal thoughts. And after that, bully. Both of these countries uh, face the same issue, which is bullying. Bullying, uh, and it is very common and it will lead to depression. Uh, more worrying. What is more worrying? Parents, parents does not consult with, uh, this issue with their children. Uh, and does not report it to the authority regarding it. So the children, the children have to face it by themselves, and it will develop uh, suicidal thoughts, and it will contribute to the increment of suicide, so suicidal cases, suicide cases in both countries. So last but not least, remedies. So government should provide proper environment. For instance, they they must enforce a law where everybody should aware of to prevent uh, the act of violence toward other person that may lead to suicide. Suicide, and then and then parents should talk with their children. So parents uh, should spend a lot of time with their children, uh, making a good conversation because it may develop a good a good relationship between parents and children and then parents should take consultation uh, because probably because most of the parents out there uh, don't have the space the necessary education to lead a family or lead children so they should take consultation gain some knowledge on how to uh, develop or conduct the children and then last but not least provide hotline for people to access uh, so alhamdulillah a lot of countries have uh, have provide hotline for people to access so that they can talk to people that have suicidal thoughts so that's all from me assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Fatima binti Ahmad Azhar. Today I would like to present my topic which is Elop in Keda. So what is Elop? Elop is running away secretly with the intention of getting married usually without the parental consent. A significant number of nation couples elope to Thailand throughout the years. The Songkla Islamic Religious Council is one of the marriage places that use used by Malaysian couple to elope to Thailand. The first reason why people elope to Thailand is not getting permission from their parents. Most materialistic parents will not give their blessing if the children do not follow what they want. The action of these parents will make their children to elope. So the second reason why people elope to Thailand is that the man or husband wants to commit the polygamy. This happens based on two possibilities. The first one, the court does not give the permission for polygamy or the husband wants to keep the subsequent marriage as a secret from the first wife or even both. The fact that they won't be accepted as the married couple when they return to Malaysia might complicate the situation for this type of marriage. 
those who elope to Thailand will have to dissolve their marriage at the Malaysian consulate in Thailand and then get their marriage registered again. In other words, they need to get married again. According to an agent who provides marriage service, the fee for elopement marriage is based on how complex the case is. If the if the couple is from Kedah, the charge will be 1,800 to 2,800. And if the couple are not from Kedah, like Johor and Johor and Malacca, the fees is between 2,400 to 4,000. And the fees will be more expensive if the couple, if a Malaysian married to foreigner, like Indonesian or Singaporeans. Next, the statistic of Ilum in Kedah. According to Dato Dr. Ismail Saleh, the chairman of Kedah Health Rural Development Religion Government Link Companies Committee, there were 799 cases in 2018, an increase of 233 cases from 566 cases in 2017 for the case of couple from Kedah who eloped to Thailand. This shows a significant increase in just one year. Next, the solution for elope in Kedah. The first solution of elope in Kedah, the state government should take the initiative to implement the campaign like Jom Daftar Nikah campaign to encourage people to register their marriage. Through the campaign, the state government will facilitate the process by helping prepare all the documentation to register their marriage. The second solution is strengthening the family institution by building the relationship between the parents and the children. The parents should respect their children's choices to make the process uh, more easier. The children will be more open and not secretive and will not neglect their parents. The last solution is there is a law that allows uh, there is a law that allows the marriage continue if the woman do not have wali. If the woman do not have wali, the woman can apply for wali hakim. So this is the solution for wali's problem instead to choose run away. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. My name is Achutin Muhammad Yohunay and my matric number is 2014421. So in this video, I will be presenting the topic that have been given uh, which is teen pregnancy. First and foremost, let us take a look at the statistic of the problem. Uh, according to the record, it stated that an average of 18,000 Malaysian uh, get pregnant each year and 25% of them are those who are involved uh, in the case of wedlock. Uh, the research also showed that 14 in 1,000 girl, uh, underage girls uh, who, are which, uh, who are under 18 years old get pregnant each year. This is a big problem because an underage girl is not uh, underage girls is not a suitable age to be pregnant. Then, who is teenagers? Uh, teenagers are referred to those who are in age between 13 and 18 years old. As I said before, this age is not a suitable age uh, to be a mother to a baby because at this age, they are supposed to be seeking knowledge. Plus, they are still at their school life. So, they are not supposed to be working. Then, they have no money to raise the child after they give birth. This is not good because uh, the child uh, needs enough food uh, and good shelter to be raised well. Uh, so they can be raised well. That's, that is why a teenage is not suitable to be pregnant. Now, how this problem occurs? There are many factors uh, to this problem. One of them is the circle of the teenagers themselves. It means that uh, the environment of them can affect their behavior. If the circles are is good, then their behavior will be good too. If their circle is not good, then their behavior their behavior will be bad. It is uh, really a big problem uh, if they are friends with a problematic person, as uh, as they can lead their teenagers to a bad way. For example. Uh, if their friend is a person who loves to drink an, uh, an, an alcohol, for example, they will tend to be a drinker too. So, as parents, they must supervise their children by knowing who they are friends with. Other than that, parents also 
should show a good example at home uh, as this also will affect uh, the teenager's social life. So the parents must show a good deed to their uh, children starting from their young age uh, because at this age, they are still learning about life. Uh, so they must know how to act good and how to think good so they can differ between uh, bad and good. As a conclusion, environment can affect a person's life. Uh, if the environment is good, then his life will be good. For the teenagers, they must choose uh, their friends wisely. And for the parents, they must keep a, health, uh, a healthy family relationship between their family members uh, so their children will not get involved in social problems like teen pregnancy. So I think that's all from, uh, from me. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Hani Shamila binti Bakri. Insha'Allah in this video, I will talk about the topic of baby abortion among teenagers. Baby abortion is a termination from pregnancy. There are two ways to end it, either by taking medicine or having a surgical procedure. Baby abortion is different from miscarriage. It means unplanned loss of a baby. An abortion often happen because of unintended pregnancy by the teenagers as they do not ever care about the baby in their womb. But in other ways, some abortion happen because of the pregnancy will harm the mother's life. Now, baby abortion among teenagers has become a phenomenon in the world. Teenagers who are facing and dealing with unintended pregnancy usually will make a rush decision such as unsafe abortion without considering other ways. It is because they might get pressure from the people around them and decide to abort the baby and it is a way to escape from any guilty feelings, shame and worry. There are several reasons why teenagers choose to abort baby at such a young age. It is because they always think that the unintended pregnancy will be a barrier to them to continue their desire in education or to preserve their future. Several teenagers may have a thought of avoiding the stigma out of wedlock after getting pregnant. Some of the teenagers are also facing a problem in terms of finance to raise a baby. It is one of the most popular reasons why baby abortion happens among teenagers. That is why baby abortion among teenagers is a social ill in Malaysia and other countries. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, in 2019, statistics have revealed that about 16 million teenagers give birth every year, with most of them from low- and middle-income countries. The World Health Organization also pointed out that, based on 2019 data, 55% of unintended pregnancy among teenagers aged 15 until 16 years old end in abortion which are often unsafe in low- and middle-income countries. As we look forward to the topic of baby abortion among teenagers, we should see how serious this problem affects our young generation. Although all of the abortion has its own reason, it is still an issue that has to be taken care of by everyone around the teenagers, especially parents, teachers, and authorities, to avoid other serious problems such as dumping baby everywhere. In Islamic perspective, baby abortion is not permissible until the continuation of pregnancy will harm the mother's life. The solution of this social problem, parents should interfere in their children's daily life. Maybe they can talk with their children about birth control at an early age, especially when their children hit puberty. Baby abortion will impact the teenagers from the physical and mental aspect. The proverb of crying over split milk will relate to this situation. Thus, all the parents should be aware of every action taken by their children to avoid baby abortion among teenagers. The teachers at school need to play a vital role to make sure teenagers are not getting involved in any social problem such as abortion of babies at a young age after getting unintended pregnancy. The initiative is by doing any program or talk at school about the effect of abortion towards you women, especially at a young age. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Fatiha bin Rosli. In this video, I'm going to be presenting my essay on topic sectarianism in Lebanon. So first, let's look at the meaning of the sectarianism itself. 
So sectarianism comes from the root word sect, which means a group of people whose religious belief differs from those of a larger group. Lebanon is a tiny Middle Eastern country that has at least 18 officially recognized religious sects, which among them includes Catholic, Jewish, Sunni, Shia, Maronite, and many others. The law of Lebanon requires most of these sects to share power in the government, making its political system as one of the most complicated in the world. Seats in the parliament are divided among the sects, with each of them will receive a specific number of seats. Citizens can only vote for candidates running from uh, running in their districts. The three highest political positions in Lebanon were also allocated to Lebanon's three leading religious groups, which are the first one, the President of Lebanon must be Maronite Christian, and the Prime Minister must be Sunni, and the Speaker of the House must be Shi'it. So what actually happens in Lebanon? Because of this sectarianism, the citizens protest this and set their objective to dismantle the system because according to them, the system is a major cause of government dysfunction. This mechanism has entrenched political divisions and made cooperation between religious lines very difficult. A simple example that we can see, because of this sectarianism, their government seems to have difficulties to handle even such a basic problems such as providing electricity, water, finding of garbage, and not to mention the economic problems which now has been a major problem for the country. Consequently, Lebanon now has one of the world's highest ratios of debt in relation to gross domestic product. Even if we compare Lebanon's currency to our own ringgit Malaysia, one Lebanon pound is not even equal to one ringgit Malaysia. That's just how low their currency is. So moving on to the solution, how do we encounter this sectarianism? One of the ways to encounter this is to improve border control because if we take lessons from other Middle Eastern countries, it is proven on how geography matters in preventing sectarianism conflicts. This is because it is an important factor in determining whether the community is vulnerable to sectarianism or not because it often originates from the outside of the country. Like for example, in Iraq, the ability to prevent the physical entry of the sectarian military into some of the neighborhood help explain the different levels of sectarian violence in the communities. In addition, the, the other way to encounter this sectarianism is also to take uh, urban planning seriously because by developing urban areas, we can integrate different social sectors and increase economy and also social interaction with which often ways to create communities that are more stable and more peaceful. That's all from me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nashaya Alisha Binti Alias. My major number two zero one four one three four. Today, I would like to share my topic presentation, which is honor killing in Jordan. So, what is the honor killing? Honor killing is the murdering of the woman and girl by the male family member because they define their crime by the argue that the victim has to harm their family reputation and status. Girl and woman actually intricately control in their particular society in Jordan. The preservation of the woman virginity and sexual purity is uh, regarded as uh, regarded as the responsibility of their male family members such as uh, their father, brother and their husband. For example, one of the case study that happened in Jordan which is on July 18, 2020, Ahlan father killed her but he smashed her head against a concrete block. Then, sit next to her body with the smoking and drink a tea. This information was provided by the eyewitness and it can be seen in the social media uh, video footage where a viewer can hear Ahlam uh, screaming, screaming cry and then the witness further say that Ahlam brother had stopped anyone for helping Ahlam. From the data of the Ministry of Social Development, uh, recorded nine crime has happened in the 1995 and until 2020 which is 2020 uh, 70 hundred killing recorded and the highest hundred killing that record between 2017 until 2019 
Based on the mitigation, government, community, and the religion leader must address the pervasive uh, discrimination that uh, the idea of the woman moral behavior is crucial to the upholding the honor of their family and community, and that male family member must prevent and clear up any honor while violence through the violence. Killing of the woman and girl in the honor of the preventer, the, Jordan, the Jordanian government should work to change the criminal code, provide the victim central protection, including protection for those in the danger, and fight damaging violence, gender discrimination that encourages such violence by the education public and the rising awareness of the them. And then for the media, they has must uh, spare their awareness about the honey killing, that everyone get the uh, real right, right uh, on them. So honey killing will not benefit only one uh, or one side. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Fatin Amal Sakina. Today, I would like to share with you a topic about child labor, specifically in Malaysia. First thing first, let us know what is a child labor mean. Child labor is a work that harms the children or keeps them from attending school, meaning that the children are being exposed to work, especially in their young age. To think logically, who are the one who is responsible to the children? There is one hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that every child is born with the true faith of Islam, meaning to worship the none but Allah, and his parents convert him to Judaism or Christianity or Mechanism. Referring to this hadith. It is proved and shown that the children are, um, I mean like the parents are the one who should be responsible to take care of the children by, by giving them education and give them a proper place to stay and everything. According to the International Labor Organization, they estimate that 250 million economically active children and individuals below 18 years old worldwide, that 61% of them are workers in Asia, and around half of the economically active children are working full-time, and 30% are in worse form of child labor. Referring to this statistic, we can see that the child labor is a very serious issue and it is getting worse in nowadays. So, what are the factors that lead to this issue? One, there is a decreasing economic opportunities that lead to the decline in household income for families. Every country must must be not, not it is it's not must. I mean like I'm sure every country have the issue about poor family. Sometimes it's because of the economic in the country, the decreasing economic in the country, and that lead to the poor family, and then lead them to the financial problem, uh, which they cannot afford their children to continue the, their study. Number two, the parents advise to work early. Nowadays, there is some parents, uh, there is some parents think that the the uh, continuous study is not important for the children. They want their children to expose to work early so that they can, uh, they can have good career in their young age. Meaning that they have to practice themselves to expose to work in their young age. So, what is the solution to this method? The Malaysia government has implemented law that can prioritize the children and to protect their rights, uh, which is that the children, the children, especially in their young age, are mandatory to finish their primary school, which children under the age of 18 cannot work. Hence, if anyone disobey this rule or this law, they will be given a, a strict punishment. Number two, 
we need to change the parents' mindset because by giving talk to them, the importance of giving knowledge to the children and to guide them how to prepare for the children's education in the future. Number three, we need to have a good family planning before we want to get married or we want to make a family we need to plan uh, we need to prepare a good plan like uh, giving a proper place for the children to stay and then uh, a proper plan to give the children education in the future so that uh, we will not be affected to the financial problem. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Muhammad Arif Hanif bin Hamidi. And today I would like to talk about something that related to the uh, social ills in Muslim world which is cyberbullying. Okay, in this slide, I would like to share with you uh, about four main points that are related to the cyberbullying, which is the first one is the meaning and statistic of cyberbullying. Number two is the causes of cyberbullying. The third one is what is the effects of cyberbullying. And the last one is what is the best way to prevent cyberbullying. Okay, we move to the first one. What is the meaning of cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is a bullying with the use of digital technology, which is it is a normal bullying, but uh, it's happened on a digital technology. The bullies, the cyber bullies, are intended to threaten, embrace, or frighten someone through electronic mediums. For example, uh, social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, online games, med text message, and other uh, media platforms. And for your information, cyberbullying in Malaysia, in our country, is the third biggest cyber threat or crime after online fraud and hacking. So this is uh, the meaning that related to the cyberbullying. Okay, we move to the next part, which is the differences between cyberbullying and the other type of bullying. Okay, the different number one is uh, the cyberbullies is harder to identify uh, and bullies can hide the true identities. Uh, cyberbullying is more serious than the other forms of bullying because this we cannot uh, we cannot identify the identities of bullies and and it can make the cyber bullies bully harder because they don't have to worry about their identity uh, being spread. Okay, number two is uh, cyber bullying is not like other bullying because it takes place uh, in the cyber world without borders. This allow bullies to bully uh, their victims and it can make this difficult to the victim to protect themselves because it is uh, a platform which is without borders. The third one, the different number three is uh, this cyber bullying can happen non non-stop and even forever which is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying can happen 24 hours per day, 7 days a week, and 365 days per year. And this can make the victims difficult to escape because it happens forever. For example, uh, when, they are, when the victim sleep also, this cyberbully can happen because it non-stop so this is the differences between cyber bullying and the other types of bullying okay we move to the next part which is the statistic of cyber bullying okay as we can see in this slide that we can conclude that uh, the average of the victims that has been bullied 
are under the age of 20 which means uh, they are teen and children and the reason for cyberbullying the most reason for cyberbullying is uh, for the reason of appearance okay now we move to the next part which is what is the causes or factors uh, in the occurrence of cyberbullying the first factor is starting from a person this person's dissatisfaction with a certain individual uh, such as dissatisfaction in behavior illusory appearance jealousy popularity and others uh, this can make the bullies uh, repeatedly mock the victim on social media and expose the victim shame in public until there is emotional and mental mental abuse to the victim so this is the factors number one the second one is cyber bullies does not get enough attention from family and close people and uh, this is happened especially among teens and children uh, because the parents are too busy with their own work and forget to pay attention to their children and it is even sadder because parents who purposely give smartphones to their children because they are too lazy to take care of them this can cause the the children or teen feel bored bored and want to seek attention from the public by doing the wrong thing the wrong thing which is cyber bullying and the last cause of cyber bullying is the cyber bullies themselves lack of religious education usually uh, these cyber bullies have a lack of understanding of religious value uh, this causes them to not know the difference between good and bad they may think that humiliating or insulting the other's people is normal and not wrong. These are a wrong uh, understanding. Uh, therefore, religious education for each individual is very important because it will always guide us on the right path. Okay, we have learned what is the factors of the occurrence of cyberbullying. Now, what is the bad effects or negative effects of cyberbullying? The first one is cyberbullying can cause someone who is bullied to commit suicide. We are usually uh, the victims who are bullied in cyberspace will usually face a very uh, critical mental stress. This can cause them uh, not to be able to think sanely and lead them to commit suicide or dangerous act. Number two is the effects, the uh, negative effects of cyberbullying is bring down the dignity and cause the victim's self-esteem to be cheap. This is because all kinds of personal information of the victim has been spread by bullies, such as past crimes or personal problem of the victims. The third fact, uh, effects of cyberbullying is it also can cause a person to lose a source of income and bring down a person's career. Uh, usually, the cyberbullies will spread slander on the, vi on the victim's social media. This will cause the employer to fire the victim of bullying in order to protect the good name of the company so this is the bad impact or negative impact of cyberbullying okay now we have reached uh, at the bottom which is what is the best ways to prevent cyberbullying the first one is the firstly is we must keep our privacy information safe and secret for example, our social media account like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, we must set up in the setting uh, to make our data, especially 
privacy information uh, not be able to see by someone. We can set it at the setting of the app. Number two, to, uh, to prevent cyberbullying, we must to think first before post or comment something on the internet. Especially if it's we want to comment on someone's uh, post or we also want to post something in our account, we must to think first because there's uh, a lot of eyes will see our post and they will comment either good or bad. The last one is the best way to prevent cyberbullying, especially for teens and children. They can tell the order or such as parents and more trusted people. This is uh, important because if they don't tell the the parents, this can make uh, their mental health becomes uh, worse and lead them to doing uh, anything like suicide and the others. So uh, I think that's all from me. Thank you for listening to my presentation and thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wa salatu wassalamu ala shafi'ina al-Mudiyya wa al-Muslim Habibina wa shafi'ina maulana Wa kulwatina wa uswatina Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam Jami'in amma ba' So today uh, I will talk about uh, One of social ills uh, That has been happening in Malaysia Since long time ago it uh, not happen in Malaysia but in other country as well I think you all have heard about um, unemployment yes the title of my presentation today is uh, high uh, unemployment rate among graduates first of all uh, I will tell you what the uh, unemployment means uh, the term unemployment refers to a sit uh, situation where a person actively searches for a job but is unable to find to find it. Uh, unemployment is cons uh, considered to be a key measure of the health of the country. So uh, there are several causes and factors uh, that. Uh, cause this unemployment to happen. The first is uh, most nation graduates uh, lack skills and experience. How can this happen? So the answer is uh, many theoretical subjects in schools, universities are taught uh, without implementing any practical parts. So without skills, uh, we have nothing to we have nothing to use in solving problem. Uh, perfectly and efficiently. Uh, the second factor is uh, that employers <coughs> employees do not fully trust the fresh graduates. Fresh graduates. Uh, this is because new graduates uh, do not have do not have uh, any work experience. Therefore, uh, graduate uh, graduates do not have high self confidence for job interviews because uh, they already know that employers only need graduates with uh, work experience however there are several ways to prevent this unemployment problem from be continued the first is that uh, the higher authorities in the state should uh, take care of these people who do not have jobs and do not leave them alone. The best way is to create a support group that uh, has the specific function of motivation and management at the same time. So uh, those who are involved in this group, they will feel more confident and motivated and they 
they will continue to find uh, they will continue to to work hard to find a work to find a job so the last way is the government can create new opportunities for unemployment for unemployment for unemployed young people that will give them a good start in their uh, career path in conclusion a new university and college uh, graduates or we call it fresh graduates need to prepare themselves in various aspects like mental physical before they venturing into the world after their studies so that's all from me thank you assalamualaikum Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Ajira with a major number 2021892 and my topic for the assignment is adultery in Egypt. And I'll be presenting what it's all about in terms of statistics, problems, and solutions or the remedies. So first of all, to define adultery according to Muhammad 2022, it is an extramarital sex which is having sexual intercourse between a married person with other person who is other than their spouse in which it contradicts the social, religious, moral, or legal grounds. And of course, it is a major offense to have sexual intercourse with someone who is married. And in Islam, it is also a grievous sin for those who committed adultery. So... For the statistic, there is no significant statistic or rates for adultery in Egypt. However, there is a high association between the rate of divorce and adultery as stated by Rada Lopti, who is a training consultant. So according to the Central Agency for Public Mobilizations and Statistics, CAPMAS, in Egypt, the divorce rate has been increasing significantly in 2021 by 14.7 percent over 2022 with the approximate um, 25 divorces of 100 new marriages so what causes the act of adultery in egypt so egypt is an arab country um, where it is normally known for um, encouraging their children to marry at a young age and would normally be involved in an arranged marriage Hence, they are still immature and make irrational decision. and once they're married, they could see the flaw in their spouse and develop the feeling of incompatibility, which drive their spouse to seek out um, another suitable candidate and therefore commit adultery. Secondly, because married life become cautious, which is common in Egyptian women, they perceive married life becoming uninteresting and hence leading them to do adultery. And lastly, the influence of social media, such as the pornographic sites, and this is common among the men. So due to that site, they will feel dissatisfaction and hence commit adultery. So the solution or the remedies to, their, um, to these are by simply um, spending meaningful time with their spouse such as going on a date. Secondly, communicate with each other until comprehensiveness is achieved. And lastly, reducing time span with social media. So that is all for me. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Noor Ayn Badirazan and for today I will be presenting on my topic which is murder in Pakistan. So what is murder? Murder can be defined as the act of intentionally killing someone else and this action can be considered as a crime. Murder could destroy the structure of the society as it would encourage people to be involved with it. So how this act would encourage people to be involved in the crime? For example, one act of murdering by an individual can lead to another act of murdering by another person and this would eventually create the change of murdering so this situation causes a nightmare towards some people especially for the women children and the older people in Pakistan, the crime rate of murder is relatively higher compared to some other countries like Japan, China, 
Thailand and Philippines. And the issue that usually associated with murder in Pakistan is honor killing. So what is honor killing? Honor killing basically is a honor killing usually occurs when individual does any act that violate the custom, traditions or culture of the society. Thus, the other members of the society would act upon it by killing those individual who violate it. So the statistic the statistic shows that there is a seemingly increased number of murder cases from August 2011 to uh, July 2013. About 1,000 women and girls were murdered by their male family members almost every year up until 2012, in which uh, they considered it as a honor killing. And also on on average, there were about 17 honor killing cases that happened every week in which it involved 913 victims. Also in 2011, there were about 720 victims consisting of men and women uh, which being murdered because they did something that violated the honor of the tribe. So, as we can see, the major reason for the high rates of murder in uh, Pakistan is due to honor killing. But there, the, but there are also uh, some other reasons that contribute to the high rates of murder. For example, conflict within the members of the society, uh, the act of revenge, and also the act of provocation, provocation by an individual towards another individual. So, with the high rates of crime murder in Pakistan, uh, I could I can suggest few possible solutions that can be done to reduce the high rates of murder. So, uh, one of the solution is the implementation of Islamic law, or more commonly known as Sharia law. Sharia law. So, based on the Sharia law. Whoever kills a person, he or she, which means the, perpetra the perpetrator, he or she should also be killed as the punishment for them. Uh, another solution that I, could, uh, that I can suggest is uh, the lawmakers in Pakistan, they should uh, take initiative to strengthen the punishment for those who commit murder. Uh, for example, increase the imprisonment year for them and also increase the rate of compensation money uh, that the perpetrator needs to pay to the victim's family. So that's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Akil Izuddin Ben Zamri. In this video, I will be presenting about drug abuse among teenagers. So without further ado, let's get started. But before we get to the main point, what is a drug? A drug is a medicine or chemical substance that cause a change in an organism physiology or psychology when ingested or intro introduced into the body. Consumption of drugs can be via smoking, injection, ingestion, inhalation, absorption via a patch on the skin, suppository or dissolution under the tongue. Drug is a substance that is used to diagnose, cure, treat or prevent a disease or to enhance physical or mental well-being. There are many different types of drugs including prescri pres prescription drug medications, over-the-counter medication and illegal drugs. Prescription medication are drugs that are prescribed by a doctor or other health healthcare provider and are usually only available with a valid prescription. Over the counter medication are drugs that can be purchased without medication, uh, without prescription, but they are generally not as potent as pres prescription drugs. Uh, meanwhile, illegal drugs are substances that are not legal to use, possess, or distribute and they can have serious consequences if you c get caught. It is important to use drugs only as directed by a healthcare provider or to follow the instruction for taking them carefully. Now, uh, let's get to the main point. For year 2021, the statistics that I got from AADK, which means Agency Anti Dadah Kebangsaan, it is stated that there are a total of 123,000 
39 people are involved in drug abuse. 81,112 people which make up 95.9% from the total are teenagers. Most of them start involving themselves into drugs are in their adolescence and in, and in their secondary and even in university. The most used drug are the amphetamine type stimulant which is 64.7%. Amphetamine type stimulants are a class of drugs that act on the central nervous system and produce stimulant effects such as increased alertness, energy and arousal. These drugs include amphetamine, methamphetamine and some prescription drugs uh, such as Adderall and Ritalin. Amphetamine and methamphetamine are illegal and are often used uh, recreationally, recreationally for their stimulant effect. They are highly addictive and can have severe neg neg negative consequences including mental health problems, cardiovascular issues and damage to the brain and other organs. Effects of chronic use are of psychological dependence, development of tolerance, malnutrition, weight loss, disorientation, apathy, confusion, and exhaustion uh, due to lack of sleep, potential depression, anxiety, and fatigue. And the second is opioid. What is opioid? So, uh, opioid opioids are substances that act on opioid receptors to produce morphine-like effects. Uh, for example, morphine, heroin, codeine, and methadone, and so much more. Medically, they are primar primary used for pain relief, including anesthesia. Side effects of opioids may include itchiness, sedation, nausea, respiratory depression, depression, constipation, and euphoria. Long-term use can cause tolerance, meaning that increased the doses are required to achieve the same effect. And physical dependence means that abruptly discontinuing the drug, le the drug leads, to, leads to unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. As for the treatments and solution to this problem, schools uh, an educational institution could make talks, speeches, or programs that educate the public, especially teenagers, about the danger of drug abuse. This step is very important at the early age because prevention is better than cure. And more, more people are on the brink of falling into trying and taking drugs. As for the drug addicts, who are regretting their action and want to return to the right path, counseling, therapy, and medication will be the best treatment he or she could get. Support from friends and family can be an important factor in the, in the recovery process. They can provide encouragement, motivation to stay sober and continue working towards their, goal, their goals. Supportive relationship can provide a sense of belonging and help reduce feelings of isolation, loneliness, which are common in challenges in recovery. With, but last but not least, drug abuse is really dangerous action to take because it can cause others a lot of problem. Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Wala tulqu bi aydikum ila tahluka." The mafhum. We can't let ourselves be thrown into the destruction, into the into the demolition by our own hands, hand, hands and action. Allah really, really doesn't like that. May Allah protect us from this unfruitful action and bless us all. That's all from me. Thank you. Shukran and Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
My name is Wan Atira Samia binti Wan Hashim, metric number 2018152. So today I will talk about the corruption in Indonesia. So as we know that the corruption is one of the social illness in the Muslim world nowadays. There are still a lot of misunderstanding about what is corruption. So corruption can be defined as a misuse of power for personal gain. And the problem of corruption is not something new. It has persisted throughout many society. So what is the level of corruption in Indonesia? According to Transparency International 2021 Corruption Perspective Index, ranked the Indonesia 19th place out of 180 countries. The 180 countries in the index are ranked on the scale where the lowest ranked countries are perceived to have the most honor public sector. It can be said that uh, the level of corruption in Indonesia is not something serious as it plays in the middle. There are several reasons that lead to practice of corruption in Indonesia. The first common cause of corruption is structural factors such as income level, income inequality, openness to trade, and low exposed to democracy. It has persisted that countries with a high level income will have lower perception of corruption. Likewise, the country that has experienced democracy for a longer period are thought to be the less corrupt. So, for example, uh, in Indonesia, it has a lower middle level of income country with a median level of income equality and with approximately 13% uh, of the pollution living below poverty line. Secondly, the decentralization contributes to corruption in Indonesia as well. Decentralization is considered by many scholars as an effective remedy in the reform of governance system. However, to be effective, decentralization process must not only empower local government with increased resources and responsibility, but also ensure that local government are hold responsibility for the provision of public services and the use of public funds. In this regard, decentralization may create a strong incentive for local elite to size resources and influence policy in their interests rather than those of the society as a whole. So it can it can offer more opportunity for corruption to flourish if accountability is lacking or not existent in the local governments. There are several solutions that can prevent corruption. Firstly, an effective law enforcement. An effective court system, a strong legal foundation, a law enforcement agency all support successful enforcement strategy. People will act out of control if there is no action for authorities and they will continue to practice corruption. Therefore, they must have a clear penalties to prevent people and organizations from engaged in corrupt behavior, such as prison fine and so on. Secondly, a strong education. A strong educational focus must reinforce best business practice and alert manager and employee where to look for corruption. This can be achieved by introducing mandatory education, such as anti-money laundries courses. Senior executive and manager must set a strong culture of honesty and integrity by leading by example. Besides education and exposed to Islamic teaching and are also important to prevent corruption. It is because people will know the position of corruption in Islam as we know that Islam prohibits corruption as it view it as a grave sin and serious criminal offense. So in conclusion, there is no denying that corruption become one of social illness in the Muslim world. Therefore, everyone has a responsibility to fight corruption as it gives negative impact on society. So that's all for me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Isa binti Hassan Azali. My metric number is 2010990. The topic of my presentation is child marriage in Yemen. Before we start to talk in more detail, I will explain first what was meant by child marriage. Child marriage, as defined by a worldwide organization such as UNICEF, is an official marriage or informal relationship between a child under the age of 18 with an adult or another kids. Child marriage is a serious global issue since it cross borders, cultures, faiths, and also ethnicities. Despite this, the tradition began to be questioned in the 20th century as the average age of first marriage increased in many nations and most governments raised the minimum marriage age, including Yemen. According to Yemen's most recent demographic and health survey data taken in 2013, Yemen has 4 million child brides, 1.4 million individuals married before the age of 18. They also add that the 31.9% of women aged 20 to 24 years were married before the age of 18, while 
9.4% were married before the age of 15. The question is what was the cause that made the problem continuously happen? One of the cause is that adult or parents, particularly those in poverty, push young adults and girls to marry men decades older than them. For reason, such as cost saving in child care and a health protection of husband family. In other cases, parents may wage the cost and advantage of marriage and resolve to marry their daughter early if they are considered an economic burden then may be alleviated by marriage. Secondly, their lack of education. Because of limited access to quality education and opportunities, children, especially girls, cannot complete their secondary school. Uh, moreover, the cost is high which makes individuals with low income cannot afford education. Lastly, gender inequalities. Due to this issue, some parents or older think that girls cannot support or help them during their bedtime. Therefore, it is better to marry off their child, especially girls, so they can save their, ma their money somehow. So, we move to solution and remedies. Is this problem possible to be solved? In my opinion, we cannot fully solve it without looking first uh, in the cause of the problem. Firstly, we need to provide uh, economic support and incentive to girls and their family. Approach that enhance the economic security of poor household can aid in curbing child marriage. Providing a girl or her family with an initiative, such as loan or an opportunity to learn an income generating skill so they can yield immediate economic relief for staggering families. Secondly, provide education. Education here uh, not only apply to the child but it also to the parents and community members. Family and community elders are traditionally responsible for deciding when and whom a girl's married. Educating them through meetings, uh, information campaigns, or public announcement about how child child marriage impact uh, a girl's health and future often spark powerful change. For the children, we can provide uh, initiatives uh, such as uh, uniform or scholarship or uh, necessary skill and support for girls to enroll and remain in school, which can help uh, delay the marriage. When girls are in school, they are less likely to be seen as ready for marriage by their family and the committee members. Schools uh, allow girls to develop supportive social networks as well as the skill and knowledge to better advocate for themselves and their future. Lastly, set a limit of marriage age. It is uh, argued in Islam, a girl is allowed to marry once the she reach uh, poverty, there's no law that set a minimum age uh, of marriage can apply to Muslim. Uh, but uh, the Islamic uh, family law uh, in act, uh, 1984 said this at 16 years for girls and 18 years for boys. But uh, exceptions are allowed with the permission of the Sharia court. The government uh, has the power to limit the minimum age of marriage in order to uphold justice based on the principle of Sharia that has been elaborate to protecting the interests of vulnerable children and preventing from any from any incident of child exploitation or abuse. So, in conclusion, the problem of child marriage is something serious in Yemen which we need to take action to prevent it continuously happen. Therefore, everyone has their responsibility and need, and need to take uh, an action to prevent and solve this problem together. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Batisha Binti Hasmadi, metric number 2014258. Today I will present to you about gangsterism.
So firstly, what is gangsterism? Gangsterism is an illegal organization formed by three or more people. Those people prefer to be together and commit a crime in their daily life. For example, they threaten others to give money to them, stealing and beat someone just for fun. Usually, when they become stronger and brave enough, they will start to get involved in the most critical uh, illegal cases such as selling illegal spills or drugs and also gambling. So, why can this gangsterism happen? There are several causes and factors that contribute to gangsterism. One is because of their surrounding and people's and friends. They usually do and follow what their friends do. They assume that all actions of their friends are permissible for them to follow because they think that it can bring benefits to them even though it otherwise. For example, when their friends is stealing, their friends will encourage them to steal too which makes them to follow all the things their friends stole. Next, gangsterism might happen because of the parents itself does not give full attention to their own children. Nowadays, the majority of the parents do not have spend their time with their children because they are busy of doing with their works. Therefore, they do not have time to speak with their children, hearing their problems, knowing about their surrounding, and giving affection to them. Usually, people that commit something illegal are because they have lack of love and attention. That is why they commit something new and illegal in order to seek attention and attract other people. So, for the lastly, the cause of the gangsterism is because of the multimedia, such as television. There are certain uh, certain dramas or movies that is unfiltered and unsecure to watch because there is are certain uh, parts that show scenes of gangsterism, especially in the action genre. This will lead to everyone that watch the movie will want to try something that they have never done before and learn the bad attitudes from the movie that they have watched. In this slide, based on the statistic that I had found in Malaysia, the case that had been committed by the gang is robbery with firearm and also without firearm. In 2019, the total case of gang robbery is 6,079 and for 2020, the total case of gang robbery is 2,998 and for 2021, the total is 5,636 which include gang robbery with firearm, gang robbery without firearm, robbery with firearm and also robbery without firearm. This shows that every year, there will be cases that have been committed by the gang which will give lots of negative impact such as corruption to that place and also to the community. And how can we prevent ourselves from getting involved in gangsterism? Everyone should play their own role such as Firstly, we must choosing a good friend that can guide us to the right way. We must choose friend that always encourage us to do a good things and remind us if we have done a bad things. Next, the parents itself should have given the full attention to their children by spending their time talking to their children, giving motivation, hearing their children's problem, knowing about their surrounding and also give love affection. Lastly, we must increase our knowledge especially in Deen for us to only do what Allah commands us to and prevent ourselves from doing things that Allah has prohibited us to do. That's all from me. Thank you for lending me your ears. Prostitution is defined as engaging in, agreeing to, or promising to engage in sexual activity with another person who is not a spouse or friend uh, in exchange for money. Prostitutes can be female and male, however, based on the history, the majority of prostitutes and customers have been males. According to research, these people become prostitutes out of, social, out of sexual curiosity and also to an extra money. Prostitution is prohibited in all states in Malaysia, though it is common throughout many countries. Muslims who are engaged in prostitution activities in two, in two states, Terengganu and Kelantan, may face public gain. In Kelantan, education for females uh, was not popular at, at the time, and many impo impoverished families could not afford it. Sometimes, they dropped out of school at an early age or did not attend at all. They were required to help their parents with activities around the house or by growing paddy or extracting rubber. 
Many were married off young, often as a second or third wife to polygamous men. And the majority of these marriages uh, ended in divorce. Many are forced to support themselves and, the, and their children from an early age. And with little education and skills, uh, they turn themselves into prostitutes. So out of 100 countries studied by art leaders, 53 countries have legislation and legalized prostitution with a total of population of 2.93 billion, 51%. 12 countries have uh, limited legislation with a population of 698.87 million, 12%. And 35 countries have an illegal act with a total population of 2.13 billion, 51%. Since there are no particular regulations uh, that make prostitution unlawful, the technical circumstances that lead to prostitution are addressed by the Penal Code. Uh, human trafficking is one of the most serious issues associated with prostitution. So as a result, Section 366 uh, makes it felony to abduct women for the intention of forcing them into prostitution and the penalty for kidnapping women with the intention of putting them to such a life uh, is also worse than the penalty for normal, for normal kidnapping. Um, it enters a 10-year jail sentence and a hefty, hefty fine. Section 372 states that anybody who serves as a middleman or controls the movement of prostitutes to demonstrate that they were helping in the commission of prostitution uh, shall suffer the same penalties as those listed above. So in conclusion, prostitution, whether legal or criminal, it is practiced all throughout the world. As a Muslim, we have learned that uh, the act of prostitution is haram and all Muslims should abide by the rules set by Allah SWT. And there are many reason, reasons as to why he does that and one of them, and one of them is because he only allows a healthy marriage among uh, Muslims, so they will not catch an illness like HIV. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, everyone. Today, I am Ali Imran. I will explain to you all about the sex torsion in UAE. So, what is the sex torsion? The sex torsion is a crime that involves blackmailing a victim unless the victim pays up or engage in more sexual acts. The ex daughter threatens to share image, videos, or information about the victim's sexual prefer preference. Generally, the pre, uh, the perpetrator will threaten to share sexual content with the victim families, colleges, friends, and other acquaintances. The content could also be uploaded to a large pornographic online platform. In addition, the, extors, the, the extortionists typically have a strong understanding of how to make their victim extremely afraid. They might display screenshot or image from a conversation that was especially pornographic. Additionally, they frequently scan or stalk the victim's social media accounts to learn about their loved one and friends. In other words, even though it's frequently a lie, they will, be the, they will let the victim know that they can ruin their reputation with their loved ones at any time. So now, how about the st uh, statistic and ways uh, of obtaining violent photos or videos? According to the FBI, electronic extortion complaints increased 242% in 2019 to 51,000 reported crimes with 83 million in total losses. Experts in cybercrime claim that hardly anyone ever pays the request amount. However, considering that sending millions of spam mails essentially costs nothing, even a small number of payments are easy profits, another infographic reported that most adult victims of extortion are female. Mostly 71% of cases involve only with the underage of 18 and 40% of cases involve a mix of minor and adult victims. Few of cases, 12% involve only adult victims. Every single prosecutor, uh, the perpetrator is male. They include college students, 
the state uh, department employee and even fathers and stepfathers of their victim sextortionists tend to be prolific repeat offenders. Uh, considering the, the consequences and stress that a victim face, it is critical to prevent sextortion. But how do we do that when so much of our love life happens online these days? Here are some pointers to avoid becoming the next sextortion victim. For the first is post a little personal information as possible as possible about yourself. And the second one is to keep your data private, use your medis, your social media privacy city. On Facebook, for example, you can hide uh, your friends and certain profile information. Check your Instagram, Twitter, and any other social media accounts you may have. And the third one is never accept friends or follow uh, requests from strangers. And the last one is install a good antivirus program with email protection, such as uh, VAS. Good email protection should assist you in filtering our potentially dangerous emails, such as extortion emails containing dangerous files and links. A good anti uh, antivirus program will also protect you from other types of scams. Uh, for the last, I would like to tell you about the some of the precautions uh, that parents can take to keep their children safe from the sextortion. For the first, it makes it clear to your children that they can always come to you with any question or concern about their sexuality, online dating, or sex or sextortion. And the second one is keep an eye on what they are doing online. And the third, talk about sextortion tricks with your kids so they know when to seek help. Discuss online risks such as catfishing. And lastly, discuss the potential consequences of sharing personal information about themselves, including one's sexual orientation online. Okay, thanks for watching this video. Jazakallah khair, Allah wali wa taufiq, wa ma taufiquna illa billah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nuhanis Fitriya Fitriz Madin from CCFM 2061 Session 9 and I will be presenting about discrimination in Sudan. I will tell you the meaning of discriminate. Discrimination is the unfair or prejudiced treatment, outlook, action of people based on characteristics such as race, gender, age, or sexual orientation. It happens when we put value on different category and observation we make about the way the world operates. It frequently driven by fear and misunderstanding. Next, we move on to the introduction of Sudan. As we know, Sudan is in the northeast and the large part of the continent and located on the Red Sea and the crossroad of Sub-Sahara Africa and the Middle East. For the most of independent existence, the country has endured significant internal turmoil and the main is capacity to play a leadership role in this area. This includes two of the continent's largest running civil war. The conflict in Sudan has a significant impact. First conflict is the Sudanese conflict that started in 1968 and continues to be a conflict problem and for Sudan split into two. And it happened in 2011. The second conflict is Darfur War. The issue it happened, Darfur genocide, refers to the mass, mass creed and rape of Darfur men, women and children in Western Sudan. The killing began in 2003, making it the first genocide of the 21st century. The genocide is being carried out by a group of Arab materials armed by the government and support to uh, know as a Jaujawid by burning communities, polluting economic resources, poisoning water suppliers, and killing, raping, and torturing civilians. The Jaujawid are very ruthless and destroying the refugees. The case of rape and a sexual uh, assault raised because therefore women become subjected to horrified procedures known as a female genital mutilation. When the troops are committing rape, and as a, as a result, the situation is threatening with the unwanted pregnancy cases affecting them mentally, physically, and sociological of women. And there are numerous abuses of human rights. Therefore, the United Nations Development Fund for Women, UNIFIM, 
need to deal this issue directly. Refib is an international organization that provides technical and financial support to creative program and tackle that fight for human rights, political engagement, and for economic resilience for women. The presence of the organization had this issue happen in the The solution of the conflict is the authority need to be reinforced in a political aspect by cooperating agreement needed in order to achieve national peace. Next, the session is placed by the UN Security Council regarding Darfur has extremely limited the Sudanese government's capacity to maintain peace and protect people. Hence, the changes need to be uh, prevent situation become worse. Later, the exposure of education can complete men in various aspects. From that, they will learn and distinguish the value of others' minority and try to be open-minded and accept the differences. It can be practiced when living together. Therefore, it will understanding and respect each other. In conclusion, the discrimination cases can become critical without measuring it. The authorities need to build the country by stating the law and precautions in the face of foreigners or rebels and try to consult his people to avoid the cases to end the differences between them. Also provide and help them to improve society development. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nurul Amni Binti Muhammad Fauzi and today I would like to talk about corruption in Malaysia. As we all know, corruption can be considered either a form of dishonesty or a criminal offence, which a person or an organisation that is entrusted with a position of authority may engage in corrupt behaviour with the goal of obtaining illegal benefits or abusing power for one's own personal gain. In other words, it is the misuse of authority for the sake of financial gain. It destroys trust, undermines democracy, stymies economic growth, and further worsens inequality. In the Transparency International CPI 2021, Malaysia dropped 5 spots which places it at the 62nd position out of 180 countries in terms of public sector corruption. According to Dr. Muhammad Mohan, President of Transparency International Malaysia, he mentioned the fact that the country had a ranking of 57 in the year 2020, but in the year 2019, it had a ranking of 51. The reason corruption occurs in Malaysia is because of power, greed for money and a lack of ethical standards. Abuse of power and pervasive corrupt practices at all levels of society should not be concealed from the general populace anymore by politicians and others in positions of authority. A hallmark of social decadence is when those who have committed wrongdoing are held up as heroes and adored. Those in positions of authority are becoming more corrupt which is having a ripple effect on every aspect of people's life. Besides, greed for money is also one of the reasons for corruption in Malaysia. Money plays an essential role in a person's life because not only it is necessary for an individual to have enough of it to support their essential living expenditures, but also because having more of it enables uh, an individual to have more power, possessions and freedom in their life. This is because corruption is a quick and illegal way to make more money in a short amount of time because of this. And especially in this competitive time when money is much more important to people's life, personal greed for money will rise, which will lead to corruption in Malaysia. Next, lack of eth ethical standards. Ethical standards are a set of professional accepted standards of behavior and principles for individuals and businesses. Ethical standards may have a considerable impact on professionalism since they give direction about the activities that professionals should engage in as well as those actions that professionals should avoid. However, there is a lack of ethical standard for those who work in the construction sector, which is the root reason for the high degree of corrupt activities that are prevalent in the construction industry. To solve this, the Code of Conduct can stop corruption by writing, implementing and enforcing the Code on Construction Professionals. Even though there are codes of conduct or professional ethical standards in the construction industry, construction workers often do not follow them and do their jobs the way they think is right. 
There are variety of strategies available to combat corruption in Malaysia. The authorities can sidestep of one of them if they want to. It is for the purpose of ensuring that corrupt practitioners give thoughtful consideration before acting corruptly or accepting bribes. They should be subjected to severe punishment and then the public would understand the gravity of the situation. In addition, the other way to fight corruption is through public education and awareness efforts. It would be beneficial for the government and non-governmental organisations to work together to raise public awareness about the issue of corruption in order to provide the public with an accurate understanding of the negative effects that corruption has on them. Other than that, one of the measures that have been taken to combat the problem of corruption in Malaysia is the creation of the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission MACC, also known as the Suruhanjaya Pencegahan Rasuah Malaysia SPRM. The MACC needs to devise and conduct a strategy for an anti-corruption program that covers each each industry. Its purpose is to ensure that the program is implemented efficiently through the effective collaboration of various partnerships. Aside from that, the prevention of corruption is possible through the installation of moral principles in educational institutions. In the battle against corruption in the education system needs to take either a formal or an informal approach to prevent corruption. At the level of formal education, the components of anti-corruption education might be integrated into the course of study for general education on a more casual scale or informal way. It may be incorporated into political movements, student conferences and other events of a similar kind. Finally, is the practice of receiving religious instruction which begins in infancy. Every religion imparts knowledge to its adherents on proper moral conduct and admonishes them to avoid engaging in behaviours that are harmful to themselves and others. It is the duty of parents to instill in their children a sense of good moral ethics and to educate them starting at an early age about the consequences that might result from engaging in unethical behaviour such as corruption. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nourish Alia Bagina Saludin and my metric number is 2119256. So today I will be presenting my topic which is substance abuse in Malaysia. First of all, substance abuse are occurs when one individual misuse or take excessive of alcohol, tobacco and illicit drugs. This issue has been a concern to the public health which can lead to societal problem and consequently substance abuse will be likely exposure to HIV. For example, sharing needles which contains with drug with other people in a group or having an unprotected intimate relationship with the partner. Other effects of substance abuse are mood swings and ch changes in eating habits which are common behaviors of substance abuse. We are aware that every symptom is different according to the type of drug, the dosage and the method of using it. This problem is currently rising in Malaysia which reaches its peak between the year of 2008 and 2010 and recorded that there are 63,446 drug addicts detected in Malaysia. For your information, heroin is the most commonly used drug in Malaysia besides shabu and ecstasy. After that, the drug users will be facing punishment which is frequently prison sentences and rehabilitation. And the duration of the time being in the prison will be decided in the court of criminal justice. Therefore, to overcome this problem, the government should provide substance abuse treatment and rehabilitation and also including counseling sessions to help drug addicts to develop a new healthy lifestyle. Other than that, family members, especially parents and teachers, can help in educating and supervising children from involving in drugs at home and school at a young age. Therefore, parents are advised to be mindful of the activities at home to prevent the children influenced by the negative activities at home.
and the addicts need to have their families to support them to get through the recovery and treatment phase. In conclusion, substance abuse is forbidden in Islam because it causes serious harm to both individuals and those surrounding them. That's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Isa binti Naim. So today I will be presenting about divorce in Libya. So what is divorce? Okay, so divorce is an act of separation of two parties, which is a married couple or can be classified as a legal dissolution of a marriage by a court or a competent body. So uh, what is divorce in Libya? So Libya is a Muslim country um, and the divorce in Libya is pretty much the same as in other Muslim countries or um, Middle East countries because uh, Libya population is mostly Muslim. Alright, so there are a few uh, ways for uh, divorce. So the first one is talaq. So the husband can divorce the uh, wife simply by saying the uh, tala three times in front of um, in front of the court so it can uh, can get registered as divorce all right so the next one is woman can seek or ask for divorce because of a uh, mistreatments towards them or others and lastly is a uh, mistreatment towards the woman in rural area of Libya so this happened because of the cultural and social um, barrier in the rural area. So as you can uh, see or as you can, as you know that rural area mostly they still keep their customs. So they more, you know, like um, they more tied to their customs. All right. So the effects of the divorce is that the mother will get the child custody. And the an another one is the court will award the wife some amount of money or compensation if the uh, if the husband are um, are known or are known of his um, mistreatment or other uh, offense. Right. So the solutions for the divorce is that. Um, any married couple should seek for professional help before they hope for divorce. This is because uh, it, it could help them to uh, revive, either to revive them, uh, their marriage or they can um, reflect on themselves. Um, in this case, like uh, the married couple could like uh, go through one by one what they have done uh, towards, each, towards each other. So the next one is communicate with each other. So this often happen, right? So divorce happen mostly or often happen because of miscommunication happen between two parties. So maybe the spouses felt like they are not heard or they were being ignored by their, uh, by their spouse. So um, communication is very very important for them to know where they did wrong all right so the conclusion is women rights are denied in Libya because they have no voice or no rights um, in the household because this is because men are the men are the heads or uh, the um, the uh, the breed they are the head of the house so uh, they they think that men has um, more authorities than men so men uh, usually make or um, make or um, having the ultimate power to make a decision so that's all from me thank you